Bingo, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is um, the, the military in Hawaii. And the title of our show today is Recognizing Hawaii's Military Children. Um, and it's a two o'clock block, so we're really interested in doing this on a given Thursday. And we have with us uh, Wendy Nakasone Kalani. We have uh, Hillary Pilialoha. And we have um, Angela Leonardo. If I get that right, you guys. All right, now we're gonna place you guys in the in the spotlight, so to speak, on how we are taking care of military children dependents uh, in the military bases and specifically at Mokapu, um, which is on the Marine base. I get that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's not it's not easy. And uh, the fact is that A, we want to be sure that the families that support our, our men and, and women in uniform are, are doing okay. And, and the children, of course, are part of the families. Uh, so we want we want everything to be copacetic in the families with the children. And so um, we, you know, we like to support them. So it's, it's it, you know, avoid problems, what have you, and keep everything together. <clears throat> the other part of that uh, is that Hawaii is not the easiest place to transition to. Um, it's different than the uh, uh, contiguous 48 or Alaska. It's it's different from every other state. In fact, it's different from every place in the world. Let me volunteer that statement. And so, and everybody who wasn't born here, you know, um, finds out that when you come here, you you have to adjust. And everybody who was born here finds out that the people who came here have to adjust. So we have to give everybody a reasonable period of and a, a transitional process. So when they come and they go, it's not traumatic. We want to avoid trauma. So let me identify you guys. You're all associated with the Mokapu School uh, on, on the Kaneohe base. Am I right about that? Everybody here is working in or with the Mokapu School, right? Yes. Okay, and Wendy, what do you do in connection with the school? Thank you, Jay. Um, so I am an Army School Liaison Officer. Um, my office is located on Schofield Barracks, so not the Kaneohe Marine Corps based Hawaii schools. However, um, I do have a counterpart within um, the Department of Defense that is on the Marine Corps base, and our duties are the same. Um, we help our families as they tra transition to and from uh, military installations in Hawaii. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, Hil Hillary, you, you are in the Mokapu school. Um, you're in charge of, of, of transition there in that school, right? Yes, um, I have the registration here, and I run our transition center that we started about four years ago here at Mokapu. Okay, uh, and uh, okay, and uh, yeah, uh, yes. Angela, you, you're you're a military wife, and you have children, and you benefit by these transitional programs. Do you also participate in the operation of the of the school? Any of the schools involved? Yes, so I'm both a military spouse, I uh, have two children, uh, and I work here at Mokapu Elementary as a parent community networking coordinator. Um, what we do here is uh, we foster a connection between our schools, our families, and our communities through uh, family engagement activities, school-wide events, and we also are in charge of, of our selling our spirit gear. So, Why? Why do you do that? Um, we do this to uh, bring in more families into our school and to um, just have a, that connection with the community and our parents and get more parent involvement, which we all know is a, is a you know, great uh, positive connection between the success of our children if their parents are involved. Obviously, it's been a little bit more difficult in recently with COVID, but we've been trying our best to have our parents um, stay connected with our school. Why do you do it? I'm sorry? Why do you do it? Why do I do it? Because 
um, I have seen uh, firsthand uh, the improvement my children have had, um, both uh, in school, educational wise, and just socially. Being involved at the school, uh, my children have um, improved dramatically. I I used to be I used to be work a full time um, employee, not at a school. Obviously, my my career was in a different field, and I was never around to just be part of my kids' school and and anything. And so I had the opportunity here to both be part of the school, the academics, and be closer to my kids. And that has um, 100% shown improvement with my children. Oh, I, I envy you. A lot of parents must envy you. They must all be lining up to do what you do so they can be closer to their kids all day. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Yes. And on top of that, you know, being a parent community networking coordinator or what we call PCNC um, is a paid position here in Hawaii. Uh, you don't find this in um, other parts of mainland. You know, mainland, you have PTAs or PTOs. Here we have the... Um, What's the difference? Having those. Uh, PTAs or PTOs are the parent um, teacher organizations or parent teacher associations. They are voluntary parents, um, volunteer parents who put together uh, fundraisers. Uh, a PCNC like myself, we provide all of the activities that we provide or crafts, anything uh, family engagement wise, it's all free of charge. We mm. don't have families for that. Okay. So do you actually teach? Myself, no, I don't. I would <laughs> actually I do teach. We are actually in charge of all the volunteers here. So all of our parent volunteers or what we call classroom parents. Every classroom gets to select a classroom parent to come and help the teachers. And we train them. So when I say we, I actually have a partner. Her name's Tabitha Gray. Unfortunately, she's not in today. But we are both in charge of training our volunteers. So in that aspect, I do teach. <laughs> okay, well, you're, but you're, you're in the classroom. Um, and I, I, I guess I'll ask you this, too. I mean, what, what sort of things do you need to do uh, being in the classroom as a, you know, as a, as a member of the, the school uh, staff that way? What do you have to do? What things come up that you have to attend to? And what do you do to attend to them? My, myself? Yeah. Um, since I get to work here, I actually get to uh, help out. I get to know all of the teachers and faculty and staff here. And so anytime they need help, I can come by. We actually have limited the amount of volunteers that we have on campus. It's not the same as it was last year. Uh, this year, the only volunteers that are allowed and approved to come to our campus are the parent volunteers that I train. And some of those parents are unable to come in because they have smaller children. So anytime that a teacher or um, any anyone here needs assistance, I can run over and help them out. Okay, but, sure, you're doing what you're training others to do. So what yes. is the training like? What is the training well, like? What do you train them in? Well, we train in a lot of different aspects, but uh, this year has been different. Obviously, we've been doing it all virtually. Uh, usually, years prior, we did this in person, so we would have them come to our campus and train. Now it's been done virtually. Mm -hmm. and myself, it was the first time I used a Zoom meeting, so it was great. So we teach <laughs> school safety to, you know, um, compliance and the use of electronics, um, just you know, how to conduct yourself in class. Correct. And not only conduct yourself, but how to dress, how to, you know, how to properly dress at a school uh -huh. camp and also provide them a badge that shows that they're a visitor. That way we can see them from far, that they are a visitor and they're just not a, a stranger in our campus. And they are physically in the school building. This is not a virtual. This is in the school building. Correct. So when they okay. come. Oh. So you teach them about COVID and masks and distancing too? Correct. So we uh -huh. do, that's a new that's a new uh, subject we have to add in our training. Of course, of course. Well, Hillary, I mean, I mean, you know, you are very interesting to me because you see it happening. You see it coming and going. And let me start with the flip side, okay? That is, you're you're trying to make a soft landing for people. You're trying to prepare them for you know a new school life, so to speak. 
Um, and I guess my question is, ready for a hard question? Uh, my question is, what happens if you weren't there? What happens to a transition that is not, that is, that is not handled? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know what would happen. Um, I would hope that my students that I prepare or that other people that they can see the aloha through me and if I weren't on campus that they could continue sharing that aloha that I try to share with our family. So what, okay, you, you, are you one-on-one -on -one or one on the class? You're in the class trying to uh, teach, instruct, uh, familiarize the, these kids? Uh, so our transition center here at Mokapu, I have Aloha ambassadors. So I have 24 Aloha ambassadors that wow. I work with. Yeah. Um, it's more of an after school club, but the students, I see them in the morning. We do tours to welcome students to our school. And then we do uh, good, we distribute goodbye kits to the students that are leaving. Uh, we, I try to train or instill the Aloha spirit in my students. So that way, as they're, they're labeled or their names are Aloha ambassadors, I wanna make sure that they are able to live, live Aloha and to share it. So we like to make it fun and inviting. And I always um, try to explain to my students how the importance of making friends and making people feel welcome because at some point, they were that new student when they came to our school. Uh, our students are here for anywhere between two to three years. And so at some point, I've met every student that have come, has come through or their families. And so I want them to be able to, to be able to share that. So I just had a conversation with my student yesterday. And he's like, oh, I remember when I got my tour. So I want them to be able to share what they learn um, from that tour. And then so we meet weekly. I meet with my students. And it's that good connection. It's all about connection. It's all about relationships. So I believe once I get that good connection with my students, I want them to be able to foster that same connection with other students here at our school. How many are we talking about? How many students at our school? Or how many? So this week we had about, this week alone, we had about 15 kids that started at our school. That's okay. In, in, in total? 15, yes. So on camp. So that's... Um, but rather for this far into our school year, uh, we've had, uh, at least in the last three weeks, about 30 kids that started at our school that mm -hmm. just moved here from, um, we've had North Carolina, from Florida, from California. So it's good to hear, um, to meet these students and hear their experiences and kind of make them feel welcomed and make them know that we are here for them. So I think that for me is the best, the, the biggest thing. and so. I, that's why I love my job. I can see that. It's, it's all three of you, I can see that. So um, I think what I hear you saying is that there's a certain uh, Hawaiian culture environment that you want to create for these kids. And you want to teach them how life here in these islands, um, you know, is different and better. Um, so do they come with a need for that? What I mean is, you know, I mean, we've been talking about race issues on the mainland and all, and and I always come away with the feeling that Hawaii is way better in dealing with uh, with race and, and you know diversity than anywhere in the uh, in the country. Um, do they come with with rough edges that you have to smooth off? Uh, not so much. So um, the great thing is once these students start hearing about our culture. Um, I want to highlight our third grade in particular this year. We actually had a couple of weeks ago, uh, our one of our community partners came to our campus to Pong Kalo for our students. And for them to be able to see things like this happening, they want to learn more. Um, right before this, I was actually teaching about Kukulo Okalani, which is a Hawaiian star compass to our third grade class. Um, this week we taught about the moon phases, so Kalana Mahina, so um, Hawaiian culture is alive and well on our campus, and it's nice to see our students wanting to learn more. It's nice to hear them, the conversation happening, that they can make that connection. When we, when I taught them the word elima for number five, she was like, oh, lima, that's also hand. You know, they can make those connections to our culture. And so my goal and my, the number one thing I want to do is as we share this with our students, I want them to take it home and share it with their families. Sure. And then as, they continue, as they continue to share it with their families, once they leave Hawaii, they can share it all around the world and they can take that spirit with them everywhere. So 
you know, hearing that, hearing those, um, a student, like I had a student move to Okinawa. And so to know that she's still dancing hula in Okinawa, that, that warms my heart because she's still taking Hawaii everywhere she goes. <laughs> I'm very touched by that. You know, we did a show in, uh, in Kona, Kona Mauka at uh, Kalei he, wait, wait, Kehe, wait, Kehe High School. If you know that high school. And, um, you know, it's a very diverse high school and there are Pacific Islanders there. Um, and um, your point about uh, teaching the kids so they can teach their parents is so important. And the principal there, I think his name is Murakami, a wonderful man. Um, that's exactly what he does. He teaches the kids so they can teach their parents. And everybody benefits. It's a very aloha thing to do. Yeah. Well, let's talk to you, Wendy. Um, you know, what is, there are other places other than Mokapu? Are there other I guess you said there was one in Schofield and you're there. Um, how are they different? Are they all the same and how do you coordinate them? Great question. So yes, we have many military impacted schools in our state, um, primarily of course throughout our island of Oahu. Um, but every school that has a military connected student in them, we consider military impacted. And so when you look at all the public schools um, across our island, we probably have more than 150 military impacted public schools here. And, um, you know, Hillary and Angela, they're at Mokapu Elementary School, but we also have other schools that are on other installations um, that, of course, are highly military impacted. But we also have schools outside the gates that are also military impacted because we have many, many military families not living on the installation. Right? And so it's important for these schools to provide services and programs like Angela and Hillary both provide at Mokapu. So and do you go outside? Do you go to these other schools and talk to the, the, the faculty and the students there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, we, we're, I'm a part of a team at um, Schofield and I have counterparts. So we also have schoolies and officers for the Marine Corps base and joint base for Harbor Hickam. So there's a team of us, and um, which makes it a little easier and enjoyable, right? So we do go out to the schools. Um, we talk to staff, just like Hillary and Angela. Um, we kind of give kind of like a sense of um, professional development, um, military cultural awareness, um, and really we're, we're great partners. Yeah, oh, well, that sounds wonderful. Now compare for me, the way this is done in Hawaii and, and the way it's done on the mainland, is it done on the mainland? I mean, if I'm going from hmm, Ohio to Minnesota, uh, do I need a transitional assist over there? So we ha there are <laughs> schoolies and officers. Question. No, that's a great question and a great point, though, that a lot of even military families are not aware of schoolies and officers. And the reality is, is that there is a schoolies and officer, and our acronym is SLOW. So we're often referred to as slow, <laughs> but we're super slow. <laughs> um, but we do, there's slows across the world. And so the purpose of that is very intentional, of course, to assist all of these families as they transition into and out of many installations worldwide, that they have that support. In, definitely, indeed. Oh, of course, if I go to, say, Europe or Asia uh, with my family, um, I do need transition over there because otherwise it could be traumatic for me not to understand what's happening around me. So I, I, are you a social worker, Wendy? Are you a teacher? What brought you into this field? So my background is in education. And so <laughs> I was with the, the Hawaii Department of Education. And then, um, and then I... This, job, this position kind of just happened and I looked into it and um, really, you know, I'm born and raised here. And I always knew that, of course, uh, the military installations in our state, right? I knew of them. I knew of Schofield. My dad worked at Pearl Harbor. So I had a really just general basic knowledge. But when I looked more into it and what kind of impact the military has on our state, and in our community and in our local community too, I wanted to be a part of it. And so um, then that's exactly what I did. And with my background in education, I this this position is ideal for me. 
I can see that. We can all see that. All our viewers all at the same time can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, you know, one thing about kids is you got to love them. And um, these are, these are you know, what, what grade kids are in the school? I, I just want to get a handle on that. It's, it's not, it doesn't include a high school? Does it include a junior high school, elementary? Where are we? Um, here on our military base. And yeah. uh, we have an elementary school, which uh, runs for pre-kindergarten pre all the way to sixth grade. They're very impressionable, these kids. And what happens, uh, you know, what they learn about Aloha, for example, um, you know, that sticks with them the rest of their lives. They will never forget their experience here in Hawaii. Um, but I guess my question is, uh, what is the difference, if you can answer me, uh, between a military kid who's been around the world? Because, yeah? you know, as Hillary said, you know, two or three years and uh, that's it. And you're moving on. That's the way it goes. And, and people who move on in their lives and have different experiences, different places, you know, travel broadens and travel broadens kids too. So what kinds of things do you see? What kind of, how kind of, how impressionable are they and how different are they from a kid who has only grown up in one place? Well, um, I can definitely say I, my kids have actually been on both ends. Um, even though we were a military impacted family, my husband's in the Navy. He's been in the Navy for almost 23 years. Um, we about four, it wasn't up to about four years ago that we actually had our first move. So we were lucky enough to stay in California uh, for a long period of time. And we did not live on base. We lived off base. So my children went to a non-military impacted school. And so my children really never were exposed to having to move until four years ago when we had to up and move to Japan. Uh, very different, different, you know, culture, different surroundings, different, just the language itself. Was there a slow there? I'm sorry? <laughs> was there a slow there? It's hello. <laughs> there was a slow, yes. There was a slow <laughs> at, in Japan. And she helped us tremendously because we had never moved. You know, we, we go to Japan. Our kids had to leave their friends behind. We had to leave our family. It was all new to them. So having a team like the slow, the school liaison officers or trans um, coordinators like Hillary has helped my children tremendously because, yeah. and myself as well, because not, not, not only are we, you know, moving across the world, we're also having to move to a new, new place, new people. We don't know anyone. And just having that support has helped my children. Sure. Anymore. They probably come home and teach you things that they learned, right? They did in Japan. <laughs> my children learned how to um, how to play the taiko drums. Okay. <laughs> they also were involved in learning some Japanese words, and so they would teach all. Invaluable of for their whole lives to have that. Yeah. So Hillary, you know, one of the things I, I was uh, with an organization with I'm a former Coast Guard officer, um, an organization uh, with the Coast Guard, you know, which, which was very concerned about military spouses who stayed at home um, while they're uh, spouses were at sea, and uh, that was a stress on the family. Of course, you know, you know, that's not rocket science to know that. Um, and the question I, I put to you is: uh, Do you see the fallout of that in in the course of organizing these transitional programs? Because a kid whose uh, whose dad has been away um, on a submarine or a ship, what have you, such as maybe Angela's husband. Um, you know, that's it's a different experience for that kid. And he may need to, you know, to be grounded somehow um, because his family is incomplete while his, one of his parents is traveling on, you know, far away places. Do you see that? And how do you deal with it? Um, you're at our school. We want our students to have that safe person, a safe adult. Um, we want to be there for them, knowing that, if you need us, you know, even if mom, if it's just mom at home, that we have a safe adult here on our campus. So that's one thing that's super important to our principal, that each of our students have that safe person that they could identify on our campus. Um, we also have deployment kits that we like to give out to our students if we know that they are having um, that issue or that separation um, 
from deployment. So we want to have that support. We do have support on our campus. Uh, we have a wonderful counseling team. We also have our MSAC team, which is a military family life counselor. And they are here and they're able to, to connect with our students and they're able to share resources. We also have what is called FOCUS. Um, FOCUS is Families Overcoming Under Stress. It's a, it's a FOCUS project. And military bases have this, this group and they provide resilience training to teach these, kids, these families, well, not only the kids, but the families on how to be uh, resilient people, uh, offer practical skills, skills so they can identify those feelings and they have someone to talk to. So we have great partners in our military community here that we can share these resources with our families, um, like our MSAC and FOCUS project yeah. that I've worked with specifically at our campus. Yeah, I see this as a great what do you want to call it, uh, a benefit of being in the service. Uh, there are a lot of perks to being in the service. Um, it, it's a great career, great life. And uh, this is uh, not only a safety net for trouble that your family might have and transitioning to a, a different location and base, but it's also, um, you know, it's a good experience and it protects the family, what you're doing. Uh, I, and I think people should appreciate that. Wendy, I want to talk to you about the... Um, you know, the resilience of the program. Uh, if you've been with it for a while, uh, then you must ask yourself, uh, how, how, how firmly embedded is it in, you know, the Department of Defense? Um, and uh, is it, is it uh, funded uh, to the point where, you know, it doesn't call for more funding? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's future. Uh, it's obviously a tremendous benefit um, to the families involved, um, to to the community of Hawaii. We want these kids to have good transition. We want them to understand. We want them to love our state and our culture. Um, so it's it's got tremendous benefits all around. The question is, uh, how how sustainable is it within DOD? How well funded is it? What is its future? Do you have any idea about that? Do you ever think about that? Can you talk about that with me? Absolutely. And, you know, that's a great point, because when you talk about support programs and services and resources available, you always, if it's a good thing, you always want it to, for it to be sustainable. And I can tell you that the transition program, the, the support that we have here in Hawaii and across the world is so important. I mean, you know, Angela, as a, as a spouse, mentioned it and how helpful it was. And so I've been doing this for more than 10 years as a school lead and officer. And so, you know, in the past decade or so, um, these programs um, and these support systems have been in place and they have grown. Um, so not only have they been sustained, but I, I, I think they've, grown, they've gathered traction, a lot of traction across the world. And, um, you know, I think, yes, funding, you know, is always part of the, the puzzle, but I think most importantly is to have the right people in the room, um, you know, when you when you talk about these programs and services, people like Angela and Hillary, there's there's many of them across the world, Jay, and they are there. The far majority, if not all of them, are there because they want to be there. They're dedicating their time, their experiences, you know, um, their effort, everything because they want to be there. Um, and I think that's the most invaluable thing. Yeah. Now you ask about funding. Yes, absolutely. There is a financial piece to it. And I can tell you for a lot of the schools here, they're applying for grants. You know, I mean, just just really that's what it comes down to. You mean to. outside of DOD? Yes, yes. And I can't I do want to say that the Department of Defense does offer grants as well. And the Department of Education here in Hawaii and across the the, the uh, mainland have applied and received funding from the Department of Defense. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, it sounds robust and it should be robust. You know, I mean, you can tell that President Biden is, um, you know, he's pulling out of Afghanistan, but there are issues on the Russian border, you know, that are threatening and, and uh, who knows where our troops will be going? Who knows where, uh, you know, our, what our bases will be doing and thus our families, you know, so uh, we've, got to, we've got to stay nimble about that and you guys have got to stay nimble about it, who knows? But let me ask you about Purple Day. And the reason I'm asking you about this, Hillary, is that you, you're wearing purple. 
so April is month of the military child. Um, month of the military child was started in 1986 by the then defense secretary Casper Weinberger. Um, it is to celebrate those children who didn't choose this lifestyle, but they were born into it and they have to stay strong. So having support systems like us, then we have to celebrate our students and we have to celebrate our children, um, our military impacted or Tiki because they play such an important role in their family. Um, so just to kind of talk about the month of uh, Angela, I will tell you why it's purple, but I will tell you the dandelion. Um, is actually the official flyer for our military children. Um, it is a dandelion because military children are like the dandelion. They, they can put down roots almost anywhere. They are impossible to destroy and they adapt easily and can survive near <laughs> anywhere. You so, got it all worked out. <laughs> I do. Military children bloom everywhere the wind carries them and they stand ready to fly into freezes to take them into new adventures, like coming to Hawaii. So um, yeah. Dandelion is the official flyer for Month of the Military Child. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, we're about out of time, Angela. You get to close. Do you <laughs> want to know what you've been doing with Purple Day? I also want to know yeah. what message you want to leave with, with our viewers. Oh, perfect. Yes, so like Hilary had mentioned, we were purple on the month of April to celebrate the Month of the Military Child. Um, it's a common, it's common known that for month of the military, military child, the color purple is supposed to, it symbolizes uh, all the military branches combined. So when you take the Navy blue, Army green, Air Force blue, Marine red, and Coast, Coast Guard blue, it all combines. To stir it up into purple. purple. <laughs> to make purple. So we, we uh, you know, so we wear purple here every Wednesday. Um, Wait a minute, you're also wearing purple. Wait a yes. minute, Wendy's also wearing purple. Yes, we're all okay. wearing purple. <laughs> <laughs> um, and next week we will be celebrating our purple up day, which will be um, here. We'll celebrate both Wednesday and Thursday, April 21st and 22nd. Uh, one of the activities we have scheduled for our school at Mokapu Elementary is uh, we have invited a couple of uh, special guests. We have our com uh, the base commanding officer. Colonel Kumparakis will be joining us um, and a couple of other active um, duty members from the area. And they will be welcoming our keiki, our children, at morning drop-off. And we'll be holding signs and cheering them and just making them feel special um, because we are a hybrid program. We have the children coming part-time. We'll be hosting it both Wednesday and Thursday so all children get to get celebrated on, on drop-off. Oh, that's great. We've and they, had, they will remember all their lives, won't they? It is. And we've also had a um, spirit week last week where, you know, every day was a different theme for our children, uh, for them to celebrate. So we have mili we had Military Monday, so we had to wear anything military-related. Uh, then we had Home of the Brave Tuesday, which was wear a T-shirt or something from a place that you've lived in before. Um, we wore our T-shirts from Japan, my, my my daughter and I. And then we had Purple Up Wednesday. So anything purple went uh, was fair. And then PCSing is Crazy Thursday. So it was just a crazy hair day, crazy socks, crazy anything, you know, just to celebrate how. What fun. It's crazy. Fun. And then on our Friday was uh, Patriots in Pajama Day. So that's, that's a <laughs> And, um, we just you, guys, make... you guys must love what you're doing. You must we love do. being around them and making we their do. lives better, not only here now and in their duty, you know, the tours of duty in Hawaii, but, but for the rest of their lives. Uh, yes. We're out of time. Angela, I want to thank you very much for coming around. Hillary, I want to thank you very much. Really enjoyed your contribution to this public conversation. And Wendy, thank you so much for your service and for your, your help in helping us uh, understand these things. Aloha to all you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you.